Welcome to Chapter 19, Part 2. In this part, we're going to talk about when the immune system doesn't work as well as it should. Specifically, we're going to talk about the immune system and cancer, immunodeficiency, and the most famous immunodeficiency, AIDS. All of us develop cancer cells throughout our life. Basically, it's when you have a somatic cell that develops a mutation that affects the cell cycle. In other words, it starts dividing more than it should. That's cancer. Um, some cancers are faster growing, some are slower growing. In any case, your immune system goes looking for cells that aren't doing what they're supposed to and it kills them, specifically through natural killer cells and cytotoxic T lymphocytes. In this series of micrographs, we show a cytotoxic T lymphocyte coming up to a cancer cell and this is what has happened after the cytotoxic T lymphocyte has basically talked to the cancer cell and told it to die. Now this is going on in your body all the time, but as we age, the chances of cancer getting past our immune system goes up because along with everything else, as we age, your immune system decreases over time. Now that's not to say that you can't get cancer when you're younger, it's just st statistically less likely. Well, we have taken the immune system and we're using it to our advantage to try to cure cancer. So in this article here, very interesting article that came out a couple of years ago, basically what they did is they took blood from patients that had leukemia and they took out T cells and they looked for T cells that were specific for that type of leukemia and expanded their numbers basically caused them to go into um, clonal expansion injected them back into the patient they got the worst case of flu they've ever had kinda sounds like chemotherapy doesn't it but in this case so far with all of the uh, patients in the study they've been leukemia free and have had no side effects from it so in my opinion this is going to be the cancer treatments of the future using your own s immune system and bolstering it to do what it should be doing anyway immunodeficiencies come in two forms congenital which is basically changes in the DNA. In other words, there's a mutation which causes some parts of your immune system to not function as it would normally. There's changes in the DNA that causes you to not have a thymus and that causes changes in your immune system from what we consider to be a healthy state. Um, but make sure you do read through the congenital immunodeficiencies. Mainly what I want you to be able to do is take what you know about the immune system, the functioning of different cells in the immune system, and think about what would happen if they were missing. Okay? Because I don't know, there might be a question like that on the test. Now acquired. As we talked about before, acquired immunodeficiencies can come as a result of age, they can also come from malnutrition, but nowadays when you talk about acquired immunodeficiencies, we think AIDS. So for the rest of this chapter, we're going to be talking about AIDS. Under the category of AIDS, we're going to talk about the origins of the virus, HIV. We're going to talk about how HIV infects cells, diagnostic methods, HIV transmission, AIDS worldwide, and prevention and treatment. From work that we've done looking at the genetic relatedness of the virus HIV to other viruses, uh, we know that it came from a simian immunodeficiency virus. We call it uh, SIV. It's found in great apes um, in Africa and uh, it generally does not cause disease or a severe disease in apes as HIV does in humans. And from what we've been able to determine, the virus jumped to the human population as a result of the bushmeat trade. Um, in Africa, they eat wild meat. Um, in the United States, we eat wild meat. And uh, kind of like in the United States, when we go deer hunting, 
um, they would go into the forest and they would hunt antelope and great apes and occasionally when they were dressing out their kill it happens you cut yourself when this happens often enough there's going to be a mutation in the population of virus that makes it so that it's more adapted to the human population from there it has spread worldwide now let's talk about the structure of the AIDS virus you're probably thinking why am I going into this when we talk about antivirals this becomes important HIV is an RNA virus by that we mean that its genome instead of being DNA is RNA and we have two strands of RNA we have an enzyme that comes in the virus called reverse transcriptase and we'll talk about what all of these things do as we talk about the life cycle of HIV we have a protein coat around the reverse transcriptase and the genome we call that a capsid around the outside of that we have an envelope that the virus picks up from the cell that it infects and embedded in this lipid envelope this membrane if you will are some proteins that are for attachment now the only ones that you need to worry about are GP120 and GP41 okay now let's talk about the life cycle of HIV now as we learned in previous chapters the first thing that a pathogen has to do is attach to its host and HIV is no exception so we have these proteins that bind to their receptor now the receptor for HIV is the CD4 receptor that's specific for T cells by the way helper T cells when we talk about the actual progression of the disease this is going to make more sense so it binds to that but it also needs these co-receptors the CCR5 or CXCR4 now when it binds to that the virus is attached to the T helper cell and then it needs to get in so this is when this uh, GP41 comes into play that causes the envelope of the virus which came from the membrane of the cell that made it and causes that envelope to fuse with the next host cells cell membrane spits the capsid inside of the cell next the genome is released from the capsid and uh, we need to make a copy of that RNA uh, genome into DNA that's where uh, reverse transcriptase comes into play reverse transcriptase goes backwards it takes RNA and makes DNA out of it whereas RNA polymerase if you remember from previous chapters takes DNA makes an RNA copy so once we get a double stranded DNA copy of the viral genome it is inserted into the host chromosome and we call it a provirus then unfortunately we don't know how to get it out it doesn't come out naturally on its own and we don't know how to get it out so so in latent infections um, the provirus just hangs out and as the T cell divides that provirus gets duplicated right along with the cell now when it becomes active provirus is made into viral RNA that's its normal genome codes for viral proteins viral enzymes we make the capsid we make reverse transcriptase we make the envelope spikes and we package the genome into the capsid and it buds through out of the cell and goes off and infects another another cell that is the life cycle of HIV disease progression correlates with how many HIV viruses you have being produced and how many CD4 positive cells how many helper T cells you have within your system okay now let me remind you what helper T cells do they upregulate all of the rest of your adaptive immune system they cause your macrophages 
to phagocytize more often and more effectively. They cause B cells to form more plasma cells. They talk to um, cytotoxic T cells. They're involved in uh, fighting extracellular bacterial infections and fungal infections. Okay, so keep that in mind when we talk about what's happening. Okay, in phase one, asymptomatic or chronic lymphoadenopathy. Okay, so you're first infected, and here's the the blue line is the virus, the red line is your population of CD4 cells. So you get a big bump at the very beginning. Now some patients don't ever have symptoms from this. Some have a flu-like symptom. But you know what? The stomach flu, influenza are so common of symptoms it's hard to say, okay, yeah, this is an HIV infection versus I got influenza. At this time we see a big drop in the CD4 population as they're worn out making HIV viruses instead of doing what T lymphocytes are supposed to do. But your immune system rallies. Your B cells produce antibodies that neutralize the virus that are being sent out. You have cytotoxic T cells that are upregulated because you know you still have helper T cells at this point and they go and they kill infected cells wherever they can find them and we get a big drop in virus and you get a corresponding increase in your helper T cells. Unfortunately over time the virus hides where we've found some places where they hide. One of them are follicular dendritic cells that are in your lymph nodes. Now we can't remove your lymph nodes if you're HIV positive to try to get rid of HIV. You kind of need them. Okay, it's kind of like giving you AIDS to fight AIDS. Okay, but as the virus hides and slowly increases in numbers of HIV viruses that we can pull from your blood, we get a steady decrease of CD4 cells. Now when you reach clinical AIDS, okay, that's defined as when your CD4 positive T cell population drops uh, to 200 per microliter of blood or lower. Okay, and that's when we consider you to be actually in AIDS. Previous to this is your CD4 counts drop, then you start having indications of immune failure. Now realize this is in untreated AIDS, HIV infection, um, but that is the general progression of the disease. Now think back to what helper T cells do. As the patient goes into actual clinical AIDS, they start showing infections that we generally don't see in the rest of the population. These are infections that we only see in folks that have congenital immunodeficiencies or folks that are really old or really young. Fungal infections, chronic bacterial infections, especially diarrhea, um, Oftentimes we'll see cancers that don't show up in the rest of the population. Uh, Kaposi sarcoma is one of those. It's a uh, actually it's linked to um, an HIV virus that uh, infects blood vessels and causes bruises to form underneath the skin. Now with HIV infection, the quicker you diagnose it, the better, because once somebody knows that they're HIV positive. They can use protection with their sex partners, not donate blood. You should never share needles in any case. So if they're IV drug users, then hopefully they're even more careful. But the diagnostic methods, generally the first method is an ELISA to test for IgG against some of the major antigens. There's also a quick test that's looking for antigens and uh, that's the one where you prick your finger and you put it on the little strip of paper and you mail that one in. If either of these come back positive, then what they want to do is do a confirmatory Western blot. We talked about that before. It's a little bit more accurate. And then we can also, for folks that are HIV positive and we're monitoring um, their viral load within the blood, we detect amounts of 
HIV RNA in the blood. So determining how much of the viral genome you have in the blood, we pull it from the viruses that are in the blood, then we can determine what your viral load is. And when we talk about antivirals, a good prognosis for an HIV positive patient is keeping that viral load low. That'll keep your CD4 counts up. Now on to HIV transmission. You all know how it gets transmitted. It's fluid to fluid. So whether that's sexual contact, uh, blood to blood contact with sharing needles, um, generally unless there's a lot of fluid transfer you're not going to get HIV. So kissing has not been a form of transmission that we've seen. Unfortunately breastfeeding is because the infant is getting a large amount of fluid from the mom in the form of milk. So fluid to fluid transmission. HIV is actually a wimpy virus. Um, it's enveloped. Most things will kill it on surfaces and when the blood dries it doesn't last for very long. Nevertheless, when you're disinfecting blood products because HIV is fatal, we don't we have some good treatments but they're expensive and who wants to become HIV positive? We act like it's a whole lot worse than it is because you just don't dare take any chances. Looking at the HIV epidemic worldwide, you can see the real problem is in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a real problem. Uh, they're really struggling with that. And part of the problem is the drugs are expensive. There's been a big push um, for di various um, charitable donations or foundations to donate the funds for the HIV drugs and that has helped a lot. So an awful lot of the HIV in, um, epidemic correlates with one access to preventative measures and access to treatment, um, both medical treatment and also drug treatment. So let's talk about some of these treatment uh, measures. Vaccines are in the works. So far we have not been able to come up with vaccines against HIV. We don't have an animal model for it. HIV only infects people. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm not going to sign up for the uh, stage one clinical trials for an HIV vaccine. Um, the other problem is most vaccines stimulate antibody production. And we've found that having neutralizing antibodies for HIV has limited usefulness in preventing the infection. You've got to get a T cell response. And so far we've really struggled with stimulating T cells. We just haven't gotten really good at it. So that's part of the problem as well. Another one is the HIV virus is constantly changing. DNA polymerase, which copies our DNA genome, does a really good job at proofreading. So you have a fairly low mutation rate. RNA polymerase which transcribes the HIV provirus into basically mRNA doesn't proofread all that well because think of it this way you don't have to make a really good copy when it's just a photocopy and you're not going to keep it well when that photocopy ends up going into the Library of Congress and getting multiple copies made out of that uh, you're going to have degradation of the record. So you get an awful lot of changes, a lot of mutations. That leads to an awful lot of antigenic changes, which means that if we ever do get a vaccine going, you probably get a booster as frequently as you do for the influenza virus. Next thing, chemotherapy. We've had some really good success with chemotherapy, and in other words, antiviral drugs for treating folks that are HIV positive. Now we're going to talk about four groups of antiviral anti-HIV drugs. Now remember back to the parts of the HIV virus. This is where it becomes important. We're targeting things that are unique to the virus. If we were to target something that's not unique to the virus that our cells and the virus share, one it'll make you really sick and two probably wouldn't be all that effective anyway. So 
we don't have reverse transcriptase. So we have drugs that inhibit reverse transcriptase. Highly effective. We don't have that enzyme. If you shut that enzyme down, it doesn't hurt your cells any. Protease inhibitors. When the virus is making that capsid that goes around the genome, what it does is it makes one great big long protein that it chops up into little pieces to make the actual capsid. Think of it as going to buy two by fours, then you cut it to make your bookshelves. That's what protease does. So we also do not have that enzyme. So if you can inhibit that, then you don't have a capsid form. You don't release the virus into the blood. Fusion inhibitors. This inhibits infection. Remember GP41 that causes the virus envelope or the virus membrane if you want to think of it that way to fuse with the cell membrane. If you can inhibit that you can inhibit spread of virus to uninfected cells. And then lastly integrase inhibitors. Integrase is the enzyme that takes the double-stranded DNA virus genome and inserts it in to the CD4 cellular chromosome. If you can inhibit that step, you can also inhibit formation of the provirus. We don't know how to get it out, but we can prevent it going in. All of these together, when you take them together, are called heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy. You take a handful of pills multiple times a day. It's expensive, but it's a whole lot better than progressing into ActiveAIDS. Well, that's it for this chapter. It was kind of came in two halves. We've got our hypersensitivities where your immune system overreacts, and we have our immunodeficiencies where your immune system sort of underreacts. Now, make sure that you're familiar with all of this. Listen to it as many times as you need to, and come to me with questions.